welcome, welcome um, to today's Mid-Atlantic ADA Center webinar, Making the Connection, Aging, Transportation, and the ADA. Slide 10, please. And we have with us today Heather Edmonds and Ken Thompson, and I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to them to introduce themselves and to get things started. So welcome, Heather and Ken. Thank you, Carlene. Um, good afternoon. Again, my name is Heather Edmonds, and I'm a program associate with the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, working with the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center. I'm joined today by my colleague, Ken Thompson, with East Shields and NADTC. Um, as a background, uh, NADTC is a partnership between, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ken. No, that's good. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, just briefly, I'll just say that uh, I'm Ken Thompson and I'm the uh, Technical Assistance Director for Easter Seals and the National and Aging Disability Transportation Center. And I'm one of the people, too, that uh, you can contact directly uh, to answer any of your uh, transportation questions. So that's what we love to do. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, as a background, NADTC is a partnership between N4A, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, and Easter Seals, and we are funded by the Federal Transit Administration, and we do receive guidance from the U.S. Administration for Community Living. Um, our overall mission is to promote the availability and accessibility of transportation options that serve the needs of older adults, people with disabilities, caregivers, and communities. And when we say accessible, we mean that in the broadest sense, for example, how a person accesses information about transportation services in their area and how accessible they are to the actual transportation service. Um, we provide person-centered information and technical assistance on a wide variety of transportation-related issues. And for technical assistance, you can get in touch with us through our toll-free number, and you can also email us, and we will provide the information um, after the webinar. Um, we also provide training opportunities, which will be webinars, conferences, meetings, and online courses, and these are free to the public. And um, we also use a variety of communication channels to reach out to the public, um, and that would be um, through our website, our social media channels, and um, our monthly e-alerts. And lastly, um, we invest in community solutions by providing community grants and programs, looking to develop and implement innovations and new models for increasing the availability of accessible transportation services for older adults and people with disabilities. Um, we recently awarded grants to 10 grantees in 10 different states to implement innovative projects that remove barriers to transportation and expand mobility options. And again, in the session, we are going to review a range of mobility options, transportation accessibility, ADA considerations, and information on finding community resources um, for transportation for older adults. And I will turn this over to Ken, um, slide 12. All right, I guess the um, big question always is, who is an older adult? You know, that's, you wonder, you know, because you hear different um, kind of definitions and different numbers used, I mean, different ages. So you might hear 55, you hear a lot of times there's a, a, a 55 and older community um, being built, and you know that's just a, a number. Um, then there's uh, people say, well, an older adult, they're 60 and older. And federal definition is 65, and I put 75 um, because um, there's a lot of people that really think, you know, when you're 70 or 75, you you start thinking of yourself as an older adult. But generally, these definitions um, are, are definitions that are artificially created um, because of program eligibility. Um, so, so it all just depends and depends on local and sometimes federal as to what is a, a certain age number. Um, but as far as individuals go, personal perception as to what is older uh, sometimes is, is, is more the issue. Um, you know, as people now are healthier, um, uh, they were more active, and they're working longer, uh, they, the definition or thought of to when someone is older um, is different than it was, I would think, like 30 or 40 years ago, because uh, it makes me think of like my grandparents um, when they were 
uh, in their 60s. Uh, they both were uh, retired, but they had a lot of uh, health issues. And uh, they talk about their health issues uh, uh, fairly often. So that, again, that then uh, gets to that issue of how does a person feel? You know, some uh, people now feel uh, energetic, uh, they feel motivated, and they still want to do and be involved in lots of activities, regardless of what their age is. So, um, especially now, a lot of people that you talk to that are over 70 years old uh, don't consider themselves as being uh, old. They still feel like they're going to contribute and be active in the community. Um, so, let's go to the next slide. Another issue, a lot of times, you know, when you talk uh, to older adults, um, they might not identify as having a disability, even though they may have some conditions that are, are limiting their mobility or limiting their function. Uh, so sometimes you can talk to people um, who are older and they say, oh, no, 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 I, I don't have a disability. I use a cane. It helps me walk. Um, so, so they don't see themselves as having a disability. Some people will say, oh, I'm just old. I need more time. I move a little slower. But uh, if you ask them, do you have a disability? They may say, no, no, that's not the issue. And I was thinking, um, I put this one down. I was talking to a guy who um, was sort of a, a guy I've known for a number of years. And uh, we were at a, a conference a couple of years ago. And he says, can you help me carry my uh, suitcase up the steps? He goes, I'm just uh, having my 92-year-old knees acting up. <laughs> and he's a guy who's very active and presents at conferences, and he does not see himself as being uh, disabled or having a disability. Um, and then other times you may get people that say, oh, you know, um, it's not a disability. I just get a little bit lost sometimes. I I, my thinking's not as clear, you know, sometimes I'm not sure where I'm going or where I need to go. And uh, so they see it as, you know, as, as just an issue for them individually, you know, might be ah, a little bit of an aging issue. And then we talk to other people and we get phone calls about them. They, they will say that their medical condition is what's causing the problem. It has nothing to do with a disability or even aging, they'll say it's diabetes that causes the problem. And then finally, uh, frequently, we hear from family members, caregivers, and sometimes individuals who say that um, the issue is I just don't drive as well as I used to. Um, I prefer to drive in the middle of the day. We have people that will say, yeah, I need to get some rides um, at different times, but I'd like to only drive between 10 and 2 during the day because that's when the traffic is lighter and that's when I can go out and feel like it's safe. So, so you know, they'll say, my driving skills are just not at that place where, where I, I am uh, as safe as I used to be. So they're not gonna identify as having a disability. They're just going to provide some other reasons as to why their functioning may be a, a different or limited. Next slide. And yeah, there are a range of transportation out there, out there um, options to uh, serve um, older adults. Um, here we have some examples of what we like to call our family of network of transportation options um, that may be available to those who call for transportation assistance. And you know, it takes a family of transportation options to meet the mobility needs of older adults and people with disabilities. And options in your community are likely to include some of the services listed here. Um, this reflects flexible and consumer-focused transportation services, which include private vehicle options, public transportation, volunteer solutions, accessible vehicles, dial-a-ride, and NEMT, which is non-emergency medical transportation, and more. Um, we realize that every community is not able to offer all these services, and especially when we think about rural areas. Um, while public transit is a viable option in many communities, in rural and suburban communities where older adults are most likely to live, 
transit may either be non-existent or so limited that only certain destinations are served. And also, um, everyone may not be eligible for all of these services. Um, for instance, you may have volunteer service transportation programs who may only serve uh, older adults that are 60 and older, or may only serve older adults that are 80 and older. Um, you have the non-emergency medical transportation that, you know, a lot of times require Medicaid. And then you also may have the ADA paratransit that may have limited services, or, you know, that it does require eligibility, eligibility requirements. Um, so, but many communities offer a combination of these modes listed on the screen. Also the challenge as well is that you might challenge, but the challenge you might face is how to find out about what services are offered. And certainly the importance of planning and coordination and information referral is an important part of that picture. Um, next slide. And here, even though we have a range of options, um, transportation is an issue for many individuals and communities. Um, the number of older adults and people with disabilities who are seeking transportation services in communities nationwide continue to grow. And sometimes those options are not expanding in certain communities to meet those needs. Um, I would just like to highlight a few of the major barriers and points of impact surrounding access to transportation. Um, we have long distance. Again, we'll go back to rural communities. Um, rural populations travel further and spend more time traveling for care than do urban populations. Um, and those can lead to um, missed medical appointments, um, delayed care. And we know, you know, 3.6 million Americans miss or delay non-emergency medical care because of lack of transportation. Um, there's also the lack of infrastructure. You know, there are individuals that live in mountainous areas where the terrain is rough and vehicles can't travel those roads to pick up those individuals. Um, again, we go back to a lack of options, um, funding and rising operational costs. Uh, transportation programs usually use a patchwork of funding. They don't just use one source of funding um, for their operations. And sometimes that funding is not available to them. Um, also a lack of drivers, volunteers. Um, there is a the technology, some um, areas, you know, the lack of broadband internet to go on to book trips or older adults that don't have smartphones to download apps to book trips. Um, also a lack of coordination, and that could be among human service transportation providers and public transit operators. And then we also have an increased isolation of older adults with transportation. Um, and those who give up driving report feelings of isolation, dependence, and loss of enjoyment. And we've seen this more now than ever in, during COVID-19, where some of these programs, um, volunteer programs, they stopped providing transportation or had limited services as well, public transportation. And some of those programs, older adults depended on to reach essential services. Uh, next slide, please. And I just wanted to highlight a few statistics that you know people may know of. Um, and these come from our um, the National Aging and Disability Transportation 2018 Needs and Assessment Survey. Um, and this was conducted to hear the voices of older adults and people with disabilities and caregivers who need transportation and who use transportation resources in the community to find out what their experience is like. Um, and this sample included 500 older adults and 33% had um, a disability. And one of the top uh, barriers was transportation services are too expensive with 48% older adults saying. Um, not enough services for people with disabilities, um, not enough public transportation options at 37%. Uh, transportation services are difficult to access 35% and not enough volunteer transportation services at 29%. You know, a lot of times older adults have retired or their limited income, so it's um, important that the transportation is affordable. Next slide, please. And this is also from our um, national survey report, um, transportation challenges. Um, there's no single go-to information resource for alternative transportation options, and most turn to family and friends for help. You know, 78% of caregivers provide or arrange transportation. You know, in 2011, caregivers provided 1.4 billion rides to older adults. And again, most believe finding alternative transportation will be difficult, and a lot of times, again, that's difficult in rural areas. Um, fewer people living in rural areas or smaller towns say their transportation alternatives are good. 
Next slide. All right. Uh, unique issues related to older adults and transportation. Um, you know, the related issues uh, for older adults is having accessible and affordable transportation options. And these are the points that uh, older adults make as uh, when they're seeking transportation. They're saying, is it accessible? Is it something I can use? And then the other point is, is it affordable? Uh, a lot of times we get calls and people say, hey, you know, I, I need these rides here and I have this private provider and um, they said they can give me a ride as they say it's senior transportation, but it's $30 each way. As people say, I can't afford that. I, I need something uh, a little more affordable so I can get the rides, um, and especially people say that, you know, they have uh, limited or fixed income. And so transportation needs to be something that's, uh, that's reasonably priced if they're going to uh, make, um, you know, several trips uh, in a week or even uh, in a month. So, so those are kind of a key issues. And then people uh, call and talk about uh, the real need that there's access to medical and essential service trips. And sometimes these medical trips, the issue is not, can I get a trip to my uh, local doctor or can I get a trip um, to you know the local um, pharmacy or someone in my town? The issue a lot of times is, can I get a trip three counties away or into another state? And sometimes the issue is, you know, can I get a distance uh, uh, travel to medical appointments um, that, that's farther away. And that, that sometimes becomes an issue and a barrier. And we know that just by taking those certain calls and doing some research uh, to find rides for people uh, when they're going to travel certain distance. Another issue and another uh, uh, discussion or type of call we have um, regularly is that issue of giving up the keys. This is an issue a lot of times when a family member says, you know, um, mom's just not driving very well anymore. Um, she's just not safe. She does run uh, stop signs and she uh, sometimes runs traffic lights and it's time for her to stop driving. So the point is that, you know, you need to have a discussion with that individual and how do we do we uh, say, hey, if we're going to give up the keys, what are your transportation options? So, so that's a, a really a, a kind of a crisis point when you get to to uh, the part where the person's not going to drive. You know, not only do you have to talk about giving up the keys and not driving, but you also need to talk about what are other options uh, if you're not driving. So, so that's a big discussion, um, and then. We get a lot of uh, calls and concern around things of um, fear of falling, falls prevention, and, and, and assisted transportation. Um, people say, um, well, the driver assists me. You know, I'm afraid of falling. And some people have fallen before. Um, and so the, the, the fall situation is very real. Uh, and it's very uh, much in the center of mind for the family members, caregivers, and for that individual. Um, and another issue we get a lot of times too is um, people who are in rural or suburban areas tend to have fewer options for transportation or they have options that just don't seem to work very well as far as uh, timing and getting that trip done. So in some rural areas, you know, if I uh, you're in a small town far out from, say, the uh, uh, say county seat where you have most of your medical services. They may only run one van in the morning and then a return van in the afternoon. And people say, well, you know, I'm just going in for a 30-minute appointment. I don't want to go into town for my 30-minute appointment and have to spend the whole day there. You know, is there some way I can make that trip? where I can go uh, to the appointment and then come right home. 
Um, and, and that's actually still, you know, a common occurrence uh, in the way transportation is run. And then the other issues, uh, you know, when you get into rural areas and even in urban areas, if transportation is not usable, it's not effective, um, and it's not something that, that um, provides a trip in a useful and meaningful way is that individuals become uh, socially isolated. Um, we see that now, especially too, we got, you know, with COVID-19 issues going on, um, we have people that uh, used to go to a senior center uh, or they used to even go to medical appointments and they go to um, uh, their, their different types of uh, social out outings and activities with friends and family. Uh, with COVID restrictions, there's uh, less transportation or lack of it, or we even have people that say, hey, I'm not going out, I'm not taking the chance. Um, so social isolation becomes very real uh, when, when transportation uh, is not available uh, or provided. Next slide. All right, fear of falling, that's a real concern, and you know, really fear of falling, like I said before, it's more about fall prevention. So we got the fear people have, uh, uh, you know, that concern about falling, and it's the caregiver and the individual. And it could be due to many different things. It could be that lack of balance. Uh, it could be uh, issues with muscle weakness or strength, uh, you know, when walking or turning or stopping. It could be a gait issue um, where somebody really needs some support uh, to walk. Um, for some people, it's pain. You know, people sometimes... Because of pain, um, when they move a certain way, the pain is so severe, the muscles tighten up. The person says, I can't move, and uh, uh, the fall is the result. And then, uh, of course, for some people, it's types of medications they're using may cause um, some unsteadiness, some dizziness, or some other kinds of issues uh, for, uh, for movement and walking around. And then finally, the issue uh, um, it's often overlooked is the fact that vision can be um, a situation where um, you know, cause of falling where some people um, have changes in vision um, it's limited maybe their uh, near vision's gotten worse or sometimes they're in between their distance and near um, where they're not seeing steps or changes um, in elevation on sidewalks and different places, and so they're tripping, um, but it's more a vision issue or anything. And so these issues of falling become very real. So when uh, people contact us around transportation, they, they wanna know is somebody actually gonna help and assist them um, to get to the van while they're in the van um, and and uh, when they're um, at their destination, you know, that whole idea of that personal assistance um, to help them uh, to that uh, appointment uh, is, is really a, a key component as to whether someone would want to use a provider or not. Next slide. All right, so what is mobility? Um, and that all depends on each individual. So it can really be different. Um, some people will define mobility as to go where you want to go and when you want to go. So um, mobility is, uh, you know, if I want to get in a car, I want to go somewhere, I have some independence. Um, that's mobility. Uh, some people may even say mobility is uh, using a mobility device, you know, using my wheelchair. Some people will say mobility is, hey, I, I've, I've used my bike, um, but it's a sense of independence. Um, and there's other people that we talk to, you know, when they find out they're not going to be driving themselves, they feel like, well, you know, if I'm not driving, I don't really have mobility. So some people feel like that their mobility is totally um, built around uh, driving themselves and having that um, independence to get in your own car and, and to go when you want to. Um, but for other people, having a ride is mobility. So it's that uh, thought that 
if I contact someone, I can schedule a ride. It gets me to where I want to go. That's mobility. And then, again, for other individuals, mobility would be something like using public transportation of some form or using some human service uh, transportation where you get on the bus or a van uh, to get a ride and someone assists you uh, to, to make that trip. So mobility is really in the eye of the beholder um, and can be defined in many different ways. Next slide. All right, so ADA considerations. Um, when you think about ADA, you really got to think it's for people with disabilities. So a lot of times, uh, you know, seniors are, uh, if they're thinking they're not having a disability, um, they're not thinking about, you know, sort of the accessibility angle on things because they say, well, I don't have a disability. I just need a little bit of assistance. Um, but the ADA consideration really would be in any, any um, type of transportation is that driver assistance. You know, with ADA paratransit, if someone is eligible, the driver will provide that level of assistance um, to the door um, for the individual um, and even for any other kinds of uh, situation, the uh, uh, driver will provide assistance for the person that needs it. Um, we want to make sure that whatever service we're provided, that we have accessible vehicles um, and that they're accessible and usable uh, for the people with disabilities, that um, you know, there's uh, equipment available for securement, there's equipment available uh, um, for that individual within that vehicle to get a safe and comfortable ride, and that uh, there's you know, accessible uh, features for the person uh, while they make their trip. Um, and if you're going to even use public transportation or any other kinds of uh, human service transportation or anything else, you have accessible pathways and stops and connections. So wherever you go, that there's an accessible route uh, to wherever you're going. Um, and then uh, one point um, we tried to remind um, providers and, and even individuals is that, you know, providers, no matter what way they use um, to book trips, you know, so many things now are app-based or online-based, you know, there's got to be ways that a person uh, can book a trip, say, if you don't have that app or you don't have a, sm uh, a smartphone, you know, simply calling someone to book a trip or having a, an alternative to just using an app be some good uh, um, thought as to requests that you might make uh, for reasonable modification uh, to, to policy person with disability uh, to use the service. So we have to sometimes remind people, yes, you can request reasonable modification to policy uh, to get trips. And sometimes it might be alternative to pick up location. It might be certain, sometimes uh, um, a certain extra level of driver assistance. Um, or sometimes it could be something as simple as uh, ensuring somebody gets um, um, breaks uh, for, for um, you know, uh, drinking, and snacks, especially on the hot days uh, when they're traveling on a, on a longer trip. So uh, all things to consider. All right, next slide. Um, so these are just a few words from individuals um, who no longer drive. And this is also taken from our national survey. And it's just to emphasize um, the feelings of uh, non-drivers or older adults and non-drivers. Um, I, I have to depend on my wife to get us around. It can sometimes be a very helpless feeling. And this is from a 75 year old with a disability. Um, I have no income. My health insurance only covers rides to and from medical appointments. I live in a rural mountain area and getting around is extremely difficult. Um, no public transportation at all. And that went back to, you know, some 
the infrastructure, the mountainous areas, where it's hard for sometimes vehicles to access those individuals. Um, also, there is not any public transportation here and not many of my friends um, are available. And then that's from a 78 year old without a disability. Um, slide 23, please. And what are older adults looking for? Um, the Beverly Foundation um, talks about the five A's of senior transportation, which is availability, acceptability, accessibility, adaptability, and affordability. And many older adults and people with disabilities are often reluctant to give up the keys or convert to using public transportation because they don't feel the options are falling in line with these categories. Um, so what are older adults looking for? Reliable transportation. You know, they want you know, to be picked up on time. They want not just to have a ride maybe once a month. Um, also, safe ride, uh, driver's assistance. And when we're talking about driver's assistance, we're talking maybe door to door. If you have a cane and you need assistance to the door or door through door, if you need assistance with groceries, taking groceries into the house. Um, also, we talk courteous service. Um, and that courteous service is through education and training programs are essential for transit accessibility and positive interaction between personnel riders. Um, transit personnel needs information on how to be welcoming and accommodate the needs of all riders. And also riders need to know how to use the services appropriately to meet their needs. And then also affordable transportation um, and easy to book and trip information. You know, sometimes we know older adults, they may need a ride the next day. They may need a ride within two days of their doctor's appointments, but some programs um, may need a week in advance to book a trip. And also to ease the book a trip, like um, Ken was saying that, you know, sometimes older adults don't have smartphones or they don't know how to use the apps. Um, and so they have to be able to call and book these trips as well. And then family or companions can ride on trips. You know, sometimes older adults, they need that extra assistance and having a companion may also have a feeling of safety and um, comfort. Slide 24, please. All right, driver assistance. So what do people want? You know, and then we talk to people. Number one is, uh, you know, they want a driver that's courteous, uh, kind of like what Heather just said. Um, and with that would be uh, that driver is uh, sensitive um, to that individual, uh, to that older adult as far as communicating. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the, what people want is that it, the driver is courteous, that they're professional, um, and that um, they, they are sensitive to the fact that um, for some seniors, uh, they may need a little more time uh, in communication, and they may need um, a little more uh, time uh, to understand or process what someone is saying. Um, so, uh, you know, having a fast speaking, demanding uh, driver uh, can be off putting or, um, or sometimes um, very much concerning for that person. So the, the point is that the driver should at least have some training or experience around uh, communication sensitivity and also maybe around um, uh, different ways that uh, people may uh, process information as they get older. Uh, people always say, uh, probably the biggest one is that, will that driver help me with boarding or leaving the vehicle? Um, they said, will that driver stay with me and help me off the vehicle? Big concern. Um, if um, people don't have assurance that there's going to be assistance by the driver, a lot of times they say, no, I don't want to take that ride. I need someone to help. So um, driver assistance um, by someone who is uh, trained and experienced to get me down the steps off the vehicle and then also assist me to the door of that destination is really important. And in some cases, too, there are providers that provide assistance uh, through the door. So somebody may request that, you know, I get to the door, but I may not be able to, to uh, do anything inside. Um, I, I need a little more help. 
Um, with ADA paratransit, and generally the transportation uh, limitation is that the driver only assists up to the door. Um, but for some other kinds of senior transportation and sometimes uh, some medical transportation, and especially for uh, um, Alzheimer's dementia type transportation, um, there's it's assistance through the door. And the other thing um, to consider you know, around driver's assistance is that if someone has dementia, maybe they would consider providing a, a, a travel kit um, while they're uh, riding. So a travel kit would be um, uh, uh, some information and things to help that person while they ride. So it may be information about their destination, might be some information about themselves, and, um, and that is there to help the driver or someone else uh, if the person seems uh, uh, disoriented. Um, um, and then the other thing to consider um, is uh, people may need assistance with seat belts and shoulder harnesses, uh, especially riding in a van or even a car. Um, some people um, may not be able to pull that uh, seat belt across um, and fasten it. So the, will the driver provide that type of assistance? And then the other thing we hear a lot of times is that people say, you know, I want a driver that drives smoothly and then they're going to drive at a safe speed. I don't want a driver in a hurry. Um, and, you know, we sometimes hear stories of uh, someone saying, I didn't like that driver because they drove too fast. You know, and that is a concern for some people. So, uh, you know, people are looking for that uh, smooth driver uh, that goes at a reasonable speed uh, so that individual feels uh, feels safe. Uh, but these, these driver's assistance considerations are a lot of times uh, on the minds of the individual and the uh, caregivers and family members. So good things to uh, consider. Next slide. Um, and older adults who no longer drive need to evaluate what their transportation needs are now or might be in the future, um, including necessary as well as social activities. Um, when investigating transportation options, there are a few things to consider in order to make a confidence decision about what options are best. And so these are some of personal considerations for transportation that um, older adults need to be thinking about. Um, important destinations for the person, you know, the distance you need to travel. A lot of programs may not do long distance traveling. Um, or rides provided to social as well as medical or shopping appointments. You know, certain programs that only may provide rides just for medical appointments and not shopping or social. So you need to be thinking about, um, older adults need to be thinking about the destinations um, that they need to go. Um, and depends on travel skills. Are you comfortable with navigating a transit system? Um, and that where travel training may come in, where there's one-on-one -on -one training or group sessions for um, individuals that you know, need to learn how to navigate um, the transit system. Also preferences and type of transportation. Um, are you, do you need medical transportation? Are you comfortable with public or paratransit? Do you have a wheelchair? Um, volunteer transportation, you may not have the funds necessarily to buy public. Um, transportation and a lot of times there are free volunteer transportation programs. Um, do you need rides in the evening or weekends or holidays? So you need to think about the type of um, transportation um, that you need um, for your personal preference. Uh, also, also again, we go back to level assistance. Um, do you need door through door? Do you need someone to come bring your groceries in door to door? Do you need help? If you have a cane, do you need help walking to the, um, your door? Curb to curb services, if you're okay being dropped off at the curb and walking to your door. Also, we have vehicle type, and that also depends on physical needs. Um, do you need a vehicle that is wheelchair accessible? Um, there's also buses, vans, and taxis. So, you know, you need to consider these um, options when you are um, making decisions about what transportation options are best for you. Slide 26, please. 
And again, one of the challenges um, in knowing what transportation options are available, um, it's how to find them. And then there are services out there to help connect older adults and people with disabilities to services. Uh, one, of course, is information and referral assistance, um, abbreviated INR. Um, INR providers connect people with services that can help them um, with a span of topics from transportation, housing, home, and community-based services. Um, for example, there's the Elder Care Locator, um, which is a public service of the U.S. Administration on Aging, um, connecting um, older adults and their families to services. And the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center has a partnership with Elder Care. We work in tandem um, to provide um, transportation services um, options to the public or professionals. Um, INR can be, INR providers can be nonprofits, libraries, faith-based organizations, or government agencies. Also, um, another way to connect is senior services. Um, a lot of times you can connect with your local area agency on aging and they can provide you with um, transportation options uh, that are in the area. Um, transportation INR information referral can sometimes occur through one call, one click services which is when consumers have a single point of contact to learn about information available um, and also receive assistance with access to those available services. And we also have travel training, um, which refers to instruction of skills necessary to travel safely and independently on available transportation options. And travel training can be through Safer Instant Center for Independent Living, can be through a transit agency, and they can be one-on-one -on -one sessions or they can do group sessions to um, teach people how to navigate the um, public transit system. And last, um, we have mobility management, um, which can refer to one-on-one -on -one counseling or again, group education on transportation options. Um, and it also refers to a broader set of activities done within a community to create partnership and coordination among um, a variety of organizations that provide transportation. Um, and, you know, not all communities have access to the resources. This is why sharing resources, information, and expertise across boundaries and state lines when possible is essential for programs to grow in their knowledge and capacity to deliver exceptional services to their clients. And, um, you know, there's different ways to promote your services that you um, provide these services. Um, and NADTC right now, we have our Every Ride Counts campaign, and it's designed to support local communities' efforts to promote availability and accessibility transportation options for older adults and people with disabilities and caregivers. And this is just a way to get your um, information out about your organization and what services they provide. Um, and the campaign com materials consist of um, carefully crafted messages and, and materials that promote different options. And um, we can provide that information um, to everyone after the uh, webinar has ended. Slide 27, please. All right, consider active transportation. This is just something that we're hearing a lot more. So what is active transportation? That's a, a, the means of getting around, which is powered by human energy, such as walking, bicycling, uh, could be a, even using a wheelchair or whatever. But it's the fact that um, you're not riding in a, in a um, motor-powered vehicle, you're providing um, the power to get around. And so even around um, many um, communities um, and uh, places um, where they're really kind of thinking about the future of their communities, uh, they're thinking of active transportation as, um, as a feature where community destinations are connected by accessible sidewalks, by accessible trails, bike paths, and then some other recreational elements. And the interesting thing for this is, um, you know, for a lot of um, older adults, um, you know, the, the, having facilities and places within the community where they could um, get exercise, um, where they can use trails, and where they can ride bikes um, is a very um, meaningful and attractive. Um, and if you do consider active transportation in the community, uh, we're hoping that the community transportation network is connecting 
uh, to these um, uh, other facilities. So the point would be that you would have bus stops uh, or um, places where um, uh, vans and, and um, uh, other providers uh, could get to these trails, could get to these bike paths, um, get to these accessible elements um, you know, within, say, parks or along creeks and rivers um, so that people can use uh, uh, these places for exercise. So the transportation network has to be um, part of the active transportation plan. So we just kind of put that out there that, um, you know, as for older adults, that active transportation um, way of um, uh, experience in the community is, is really, really attractive and uh, yeah, important. Uh, next slide. And we just want to make mention of the complete trip. And uh, complete trip is essential to helping older adults make a seamless journey. Um, complete trip means that a user can get from point A to point B seamlessly, regardless of the number of modes, transfer, and connections. Um, and the complete trip concept synthesizes aspects of a person's trip from the time the individual begins to plan the trip to when he or she leaves the or ordinating location when stating starting a journey to the doorstep of a final destination. You know, and using a uh, public transportation or a blend of public and private options is now being recognized as more complex than simply boarding and um, alighting from a vehicle. Um, and to have a successful journey, there are several actions that an individual must initiate before and after the trip. You know, complete trip involves um, trip planning from door of origin to door of destination outdoor navigation and intersection crossing. If you are, you know, coming from the Metro, you need to get across the street to get to the bus, um, boarding and using vehicles. Um, if you need to transfer between vehicle modes, if you're going from a bus, I mean, to the Metro, I mean, that's transfer, transferring between different vehicles or modes. Slide 29, please. And also here we have different type of payment services um, using stops or stations, um, outdoor to indoor transition, inside navigation, and completing travel to local destinations. You know, if one segment of the trip is inaccessible, unreliable, or inefficient, then access to subsequent segments is broken and the trip cannot be completed. So all these elements must be completed um, to make the trip. Slide 30, please. All right, um, I'm put this uh, kind of slide up here because I was thinking of, you know, what's the feature and we hear so much about um, autonomous vehicles as kind of the future for the country. So what's an autonomous vehicle? And that's what some people might call a uh, self-driving car. Uh, that would be a vehicle that would show up without a driver. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, people say, yeah, that's going to be a great uh, change in the way that transportation provide is provided so there's so much potential and you know basically the thought is that as um, as our population ages and people aren't driving you know autonomous vehicles could uh, very much fill that need so there's so much uh, um, possibility um, but the point is when we're thinking of autonomous vehicles we can't just have them available for some people yeah <laughs> you know if you have a uh, a vehicle that's not accessible, then it's not going to work, right? So you're going to have that car running around and picking up people that are ambulatory or people that are not in wheelchairs. But if you're going to run autonomous vehicles as part of um, the transportation system and uh, to augment uh, mobility for people, um, we really feel like they should be designed and built with accessibility. Um, you know, so they kind of let's build a vehicle that will work for everyone um, and run those vehicles around so that, you know, we don't only have, you know, uh, 10, 20 percent of our autonomous vehicles accessible. Let's have a accessible vehicles uh, providing those trips so we have as many as possible so that someone who has a disability, use a mobility device or just even has 
um, some issues with um, with gait, um, with walking, or you know, um, getting in and out of vehicle, that they would have a vehicle that they could use uh, to make their trip. Um, so, um, you know, ideally, you would have those autonomous vehicles designed with input and testing uh, from a, a range of people with disabilities, so that it will work for the most number of people. And these autonomous vehicles, when they do come around, can be really much a big part of our community transportation network. Uh, they would be an option. The difference would be is, uh, that there might not be a driver. Um, but the point would be if you need personal assistance, uh, there's the discussion would be then that someone would ride on that vehicle. They may not drive the vehicle, but they would be there to provide assistance. So you could have a person on it, there, but it, might, it may not be a driver uh, uh, providing, but the person uh, providing assistance uh, could be riding along. But, but yeah, that would be a huge, huge change in our network. So we got to kind of think about where we may be headed with autonomous vehicles. But um, you know, the point really is that the vehicles are accessible and usable uh, for all people. So that's kind of uh, the um, thought on, on those vehicles as we hear so much about it. Let's uh, go ahead and move to slide uh, 31. That's our final thoughts. Uh, final thoughts. Um, we have the part that the rural and suburban areas have different needs, you know, and when you talk about people with disabilities, you talk about seniors, um, you know, rural areas, there's fewer providers, there's longer distance to travel, they may not be infrastructure um, available uh, that's accessible. Uh, or you may not even have roads where some um, providers uh, who have vehicles are willing uh, to to travel on those uh, roads. Uh, you know, I know in areas where there's um, uh, washed out roads or dirt roads or whatever, um, you know, nobody's even going to run a, a human service or senior van up that road to pick up the person. And we get calls sometimes, in especially mountainous areas, they said, well, no one's going to come up my lane uh, to pick me up. And they have to uh, uh, figure out a way to get to the bottom of the lane to get the ride. Uh, and, and so that becomes a real barrier as far as getting a ride. And then uh, even in some suburban areas, people say, well, you know, it's suburban. People think, well, there's plenty of providers out here. On suburban areas, sometimes there's uh, a, a whole issue of scale and distance. Um, um, so, so you have public transportation kind of in the core areas. But when you get farther out um, into the suburbs where there's less populations or you get developments where um, housing and um, different um, built elements such as uh, shopping centers, even medical offices are more spread out, uh, there's fewer providers that can make those trips. So we gotta always keep in mind that, you know, it's not one type, one system or one size uh, for everybody. Uh, each area is kind of unique and the needs are really different. And the other point I like to make sometimes now, you know, even in our country, you know, when you get into very rural areas, um, you know, there is no um, cell phone uh, coverage. Uh, I've been parts of West Virginia where um, you can literally be in a whole valley and there's no cell coverage. And, you know, when people are relying on phone calls and apps and smartphones, uh, that just doesn't work. Um, there's no cell service, there's no signal, and so people need to think about other alternatives uh, for those individuals. Um, so there's sometimes a big digital divide as far as uh, access uh, to the internet. Um, and then there's also the issue of some people that still you know, do not have um, smartphones, they do not have computers, uh, they just have their landline phone in the house, and that's how they uh, connect and communicate with people. And in some areas, that is the only option. So uh, I keep those, those thoughts in mind when we think of uh, transportation. And then we final thought, multiple solutions for public and private transportation. You know, we're talking about older adults or people with disabilities, caregivers, and veterans. There may be need for other types of services to supplement transportation that's um, been designed for the general public in mind. 
Um, also, local solutions that include stakeholder partnerships, you know, that will include older adults and people with disabilities. When you're um, designing transportation services, you know, you should have input from older adults and people with disabilities um, on that level when you're develop developing solutions for, um, you know, transportation options. Yeah, and, and this point there is, you know, really that uh, these are partnerships between the mm -hmm. different individuals. So you want to mm -hmm. have, uh, um, you know, your local solution to meet mm -hmm. those local needs. So say if you're in a very, very rural area with very limited services, you know, who can really provide those trips? And then also um, if you're in an area where there's not a lot of um, built in infrastructure or you're having, you know, dirt and rutted roads or, the, like I said, these long kind of uh, lanes uh, in mountainous areas, um, you know, how do we kind of figure out uh, ways to um, make that trip um, when a uh, local uh, provider, I mean, human service, it could be public, will not go up that lane to uh, pick up that individual. You know, what are those options uh, to make that ride happen? All right, any other thoughts, Heather? <laughs> I think we final thoughts done. Okay. So I think uh, that's kind of where we're at right now as, as far as wrapping up. I think we gave some information that I think would be kind of useful, you know, for our seniors but, um, um, and, and older adults is, is think about, um, you know, there's uh, needs that need to be met and that we need to uh, kind of find out uh, ways to meet those needs uh, by working together. So, uh, I guess we're going to be moving into uh, questions. All right, sounds good. Thanks so much, Ken and Heather. Um, yes, it looks like we've got, you know, some good time here for questions. Um, and we did actually, we had a few come through. Um, let's see, first of all, there is, um, I think it's more of a comment than a question. I will go ahead and um, read this one. It says, there are lots of transportation webinars right now asking for feedback regarding persons with disabilities. I participated in an ADA AV demo ride yesterday. They assisted a person who's blind, one who is deaf, one who had a wheelchair, and a number of others there to encourage the inclusive activity. This was a very interesting presentation. Just as autonomous vehicles should be designed to be accessible to all users versus an afterthought, the same issues come up with EV charging stations. I sit on an accessibility advisory council and we're also looking at the design of EV charging stations that are another hot topic these days. Um, we designed standard guidelines to ensuring EV charging stations are fully accessible, but are having a hard time finding out who to elevate this to so it can be considered a standard in our state as well as the nation. If you have any suggestions, we would greatly appreciate it. Did all of that make sense? <laughs> yeah, well, and these are charging stations for like mobility devices is that um is that point i guess they're maybe for electric cars electric maybe car. stations, maybe let's see uh, if the, um, the person puts in the comments if they're still with us if the person who had the question about the ev charging stations could um let us know. Just says Department of Energy puts out a guide on charging stations, but for which type of vehicle? I believe they might be referring to electric vehicles. That's oh, electric right. vehicles. Yeah. Okay, so it's EV for electric vehicles and charging stations. Yeah. And far as accessibility around them, I guess, is that yes. an issue probably? Yeah, and who would you? Because um, you know, I'm not real familiar with with actually those charging stations as to 
you know, um, just what I've seen, you know, some of them look like that you need to have reach. There's no like accessible space around the charging station itself to do the connection, right? Mm -hmm. So the issue would be then, um, you know, it, it's probably not been thought about um, um, that uh, the charging station, it sounds like now it almost needs to be applied just to, you know, our, our, our basic ADA infrastructure. Um, you know, let's say you're gonna put in a charging station off a parking lot, then it's got to be accessible because someone might be using a wheelchair or have some mobility limitations as even for gate moving around that the uh, charging station has to be at a height that you can reach, uh, that there's clear space at the bottom of the charging station. A lot of them I noticed the, the charging station comes right up to the curb edge, but there's not um, you know a sidewalk or anything around it. It's just basically the parking lot uh, and the charging. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a, gr a grand point. Um, I, I, you know, the, the um, TRB is actually taking uh, problem statements uh, right now, I think, and uh, so uh, they're going on. But that might be a place you want to put in a uh, transportation research board, but uh, you might go uh, look at putting in a problem statement as to that issue, right? I think that's probably a, a, a way to to kind of handle it, to get it on an agenda so that, uh, you know, that could be addressed. Thank you. Um, so, and another thing that's really more of a comment than a question, and you probably saw this, but um, I think it was about a week ago, or a couple weeks ago, the um, U.S. Department of Transportation put out a, um, their strategic plan, the draft of their strategic plan on accessible transportation, and they are looking for, um, you know, it's open for public review and comment. So that is something for those of you listening, you know, go to the Department of, of uh, Transportation website, take a look, you know, through their newsroom or their press releases, and you can access that strategic plan. So that's that's something that's big news right now <laughs> for accessible transportation. Um, and then yeah, let me yeah. oh go ahead sorry oh yeah and I'm just saying that, you know that's really important to to get whatever thoughts you have on that plan because um, you know the, uh, people's um, thoughts and impressions um, will be um, uh, you know looked at uh, to shape you know, programs as we move forward. Um, and so, you know, whatever you have is an idea. You know, that's one of those things I say, there's not a bad idea. <laughs> Get it out there and, uh, you know, then, then it's all kind of on the record and, uh, you know, we can have um, um, people to think and react to those, those, uh, those issues that you have. Right, and then uh, something on the charging stations, they just said uh, Department of Energy has, um, the Department of Energy actually puts out a guide on charging stations, so that's good to know. Okay. Um, so just scrolling through the questions here. Um, this was a question that came in earlier. Um, are there any considerations regarding the complexity of the new transportation modalities and the aging driver. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and so it's the complexity mode, and and is, and I think, are you talking about all the electronics within the car, <laughs> or is uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, is is that the point? You know, you get in cars now, you got um, you know, cl collision avoidance, but also. The issue you have in a lot of cars that people get really frustrated with is that a lot of cars now it's touch screen. Mm. So, so many things, you know, I was one time um, in a car where um, uh, the air conditioning and air circulation and all that stuff was nothing but touch screens. And, you know, you ever get in a rental car where you can't figure out how anything works and you're pulling out of the airport and and then you got to figure out a touch screen while you're driving but i mean it's it's difficult um but yeah i don't know if that's the point but there's so many uh, so much of what operates a car now is is you know based on a digital or electronic system and trying to figure out uh, 
you know, how these systems work, what they can do, how do you turn them off is another issue, right? Um, yeah, um, people need to think about, is there a bypass to, to some of these systems? And, 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 and they're just sometimes, I think, you know, cumbersome and complex uh, to, to try to figure out uh, in the car. So, I mean, they're, they're good if they're working, but you got to figure them out to use them. Right. Um, here's a question. Our area in the South has not been able to recruit volunteers for rural areas. Um, due to what she mentioned, do you have any additional suggestions for that? So, so it's just getting volunteer drivers. Is that correct? It looks like people yes. to drive to the rural area. What do you think, Heather? Um, you know, um, well, I mean, there's a lot of options. There's, I mean, I know a lot of programs um, that have talked to rural areas. Um, they're recruiting um, maybe younger drivers um, through um, online, like having set up Zoom. Um, sessions to, to kind of recruit younger drivers, um, also putting ads in a newspaper, um, just having kind of, you know, virtual events. Um, I know it's harder in rural areas to recruit um, individuals, but um, those are one of the things that they're doing um, and kind of like branding themselves um, using like having events where they can um, have like car keys or hats or anything, just kind of branding um, their transportation program. Um, so I can put in some resources, some um, um, organizations to connect to. I know it's the Volunteer Transportation Center up in Buffalo, New York, and um, they do a great job of recruiting volunteers. I think they maybe have like 300 volunteers. So I can put um, information in there and they can connect with them um, as well um, for more information. Um, gosh, we have more questions coming in here. Um, that's great though. Um, so, a um, couple more comments, you know, just some info share here. We have one person who says, AARP is sponsoring AF slash or age-friendly action plans under the auspices of the World Health Organization. Much of what is proposed in these action plans is applicable to the ADA community. So, that's good to know. Um, another comment, it says CarFit is available to help older adults learn how to use their cars. Um, and it's here at um, car-fit.org. So that might be helpful. <laughs> um, then we've got um, something about transportation vouchers. It says how do individuals go about getting transportation vouchers? If one is on Medicare, can they get a voucher? Yeah, and that all depends. I mean, depending what kind of voucher or service it is, because vouchers are pretty much local as far as uh, you know how they can be used or what they can be used for. So if you have vouchers available, um, you know, if, if um, you know, there, there's restrictions to them, then you got to kind of live with those restrictions. Um, and so, so you got to kind of find out um, who's who's providing the voucher, where the limitations, where the trip types, um, and um, you know. So there's some vouchers that are for only medical trips. Um, there's some vouchers that are for you know just uh, uh, certain types of um, uh, trips uh, at certain times, and then uh, I've been places where they say, you know, we only give out a certain amount of vouchers to each individual. So in a month, a person can only get $50 say, worth of voucher money um, because we have very limited uh, budget. So you, so you may want to find out um, who's providing those vouchers and, and what the limitations might be. Right. Um, we've got... Um, this question here, do you have advice for transit agencies wanting to work with their local COA to provide medical transportation? And then how can we most effect effectively show you the value of the service 
And are there specific data points that are of most interest? So, you want to take that one, Heather, on the... So you... Sorry. Um, so, working, how, working with their COA for providing medical transportation? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, how, how do you... What advice would you have for transit agencies who are trying to work with their local COA to provide medical transportation? Hmm. That one I would have to do a little bit of research on. Um, yeah, that one I would have to get back. I mean, I can you know do a research on and find the answer for that um, for that question. But Ken, do you have? Yeah, I, you know, and the only thing I would add is um, that um, if you want to work with COA, you know, any aging folks, yeah, you, know, you you do get in touch with them directly, and you say, here's what. Um, Here's what I propose. Here's my ideas, and uh, just kind of, kind of open up that conversation. You know, transportation providers have resources. Uh, they provide rides, but they have vehicles. They have personnel, um, and and and, um, and the COA may have needs. Um, um, so you get together and figure out what might work. Um, and a lot of times, what people do is you kind of build up the framework and then you might do a sort of a pilot and try it out. Um, you know, the issue a lot of times is working out the logistics and then the funding uh, to make sure that can be uh, used and sustained. So uh, have that conversation, but we can look for um, resources as to, you know, some, probably some examples of, of situations where transit has worked with COA and how that, how that all came about. So, uh, Always have have some ideas in the back of my mind, but I want to make sure I'm right with that before I even mention it. But it's uh, but we can uh, we can do that. So great. Um, we had a couple of people who put in a couple of suggestions for where to find drivers. Um, one person is saying, you know, you can check with you know churches. Um, another is uh, oh, I lost it. Hang on, it is called. And I wasn't check with yeah. acronym, so maybe you can clarify. Um, MCOTA has a volunteer driver forum series with all kinds of resources. So, um, so you know, there there's some ideas. There are places where we can find, and we just have to pull them together, right? So, right. Um, right. So uh, another question we had here, and let me scroll down here. Um, oh, where did I, let's see. Um, so um, we've got, can someone help older adults with using the bus? We have people who want to learn more about schedules and fares. All right, yeah. Um, that's really that one around maybe transit orientation or uh, travel training or something like that. But usually the provider, you want to contact that provider and say, hey, you know, we have some people that want to learn. It could be a, a group situation um, where where the uh, transit provider sends someone out and kind of works with a group of people over schedules and fares. And uh, sometimes what happens is, um, really works is you do that sort of bus ride. So you have a group of people going out with someone um, from the transit agency and they actually go on the bus and take a ride uh, to a certain destination and then take a ride back. And uh, in that process, you look at uh, schedules, you look at how the bus runs, you look at how to pay the fare, you look at the facilities on the bus and then that, a lot of times gets people comfortable um, with riding, but um, you know, just contact your provider and say, hey, hey, we have some interested people that want to ride, and no transit provider is going to say, no, we don't want riders. <laughs> They're going to say, you know, let's, uh, yeah, we'll be right there to, to uh, have a discussion. But uh, yeah, so, so it can be a kind of a fun outing for people. Um, yeah, we've gotten calls from people that uh, actually have a bus stop by their house 
and uh, they call and they're looking for a ride and we talk to them and, we, and, and sometimes I ask, I say, you have a bus, sta bus stop nearby? And they go, yeah, I do, but that's not for me. Because some people, especially uh, older adults say, you know, that bus stop for somebody, not me. But I said, you yeah, know, somebody could come out and help you uh, uh, use that bus, you know, and you can get comfortable with it. So uh, that's my recommendation. Well, it looks like we have some other uh, comments on, on resources here. That's great. Thanks, folks. Um, this one says, one other resource to consider is Chorus. The clearinghouse for older road user safety. Oh, yeah. And it's um, the website here is roads a f e and oh oh road safe seniors got it uh -huh. <laughs> road <safe> seniors <laughs> dot org and it says they have access to a lot of information to help with transportation planning how family members can help and other resources. Uh, and are continuing to build their library. So that's good to know. Okay. Um, and then another uh, person said, our Center for Independent Living has a travel training program through a um, grant from our local transit system. And we teach skills like how to read schedules, how to ride, how to pay the fare. Um, so that's another resource for that. Um, and then someone just asked, you know, if you could um, just, just spell out what the acronym, um, the, the, sorry, the, um, what is it, the COEs, the, um, sorry, in the, oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, what we were talking about earlier, which was the um, COAs, sorry, if you could spell out what that acronym is. What is it? Oh, yeah. The Council on Aging? Yeah, oh, Council on Aging. Got it. Mm -hmm. Council on Aging. Great, great. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got, looks like, you know, about 10 minutes left here for questions. Um, you guys doing okay with the questions, Heather and Ken? <laughs> yep, yep, we're good. Great. Um, so um, here's one that's probably hot topic of the moment. I also have a senior who's concerned that riding a bus is not safe during the pandemic. What is being done to make riding safer? Yeah, <laughs> this actually is a, <laughs> right now everything's COVID, right? So, right, I right. Mean, and, and we do just, I mean, we get a steady stream of um, calls around COVID and, and um, you know, we, we've had, many calls people saying that you know i've been using the bus but you know i'm not feeling comfortable because seniors or older adults say you know i don't want to get covid you know i'm not going to go out unless i absolutely have to but then people get to a point where they actually have to go out for for different reasons and then people will say is it really safe you know what's being done and one thing's being done you know a lot of uh, buses now that's including vans and stuff, um, providers are doing social distancing on the bus. Um, there's um, some providers were doing, at least at one point, they were doing solo trips. So you had one person on getting the ride, um, but as demand has increased, what uh, people are doing is just having two people on the van. Um, it just makes it a little bit more financially viable, but also you can provide a, a ride. So, so you think about just two people spaced on the van, um, personal protective equipment such as face masks are provided. Um, you know, the drivers wear personal protective equipment. Everybody riding has to wear it and they try to position people where there's a fair amount of space. A lot of times it's a diagonal spacing between the individuals. Um, some trans agencies are, have thought about how they run the ventilation. So. So there's um, airflow where, you know, there's air going out of the bus. So you turn on um, you know, ventilation like air conditioners, but you're, you're blowing some of that air with some windows open to push some of the air out. Might be a little bit colder ride, but the airflow is actually better. So we've done that. And then the thing that all the providers are doing is they're doing thorough cleaning of the vehicles. So. 
um, after each trip, the vehicle is clean uh, so that you're um, assured that, um, that, you're, you know, that there's less chance of any kind of uh, uh, contamination issue. Um, so, and related to that, is there a good resource or place to contact for information on local COVID testing or vaccinations? Um, good place to start is your department, your state department of health and human services um, to find out for testing and also to find out what or, um, programs are providing transportation to those testing sites. Um, and kind of related to that, are there issues with disabled veterans gaining accessible transportation to get their COVID vaccine? I'm not sure if you can speak to that or not, but. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't speak to that because I don't have the details on that. But um, mm -hmm. one thing I can add a lot of times uh, for, for a lot of veterans in general, not only just for vaccines, um, especially when you're getting out more urban areas, you know, transportation becomes very uh, limited. Um, so um, sometimes uh, you have disabled veterans, you know, that um, want to have transportation, um, but the normal transportation network and resources don't provide the kind of trips that um, uh, they're preferring. And so there is some sometimes limitations in, in providing uh, the rides. So. And this one says hands-on assistance and COVID safety recommendations can sometimes be contradicting. Trying to navigate a safe approach is daunting for anyone in the industry in addition to the seniors themselves. Any ideas or resources that can help with implementing safety precautions for the provider and communication for the rider? Um. Yeah, I think, what do you think, uh, Heather, our NADTC COVID resource uh, um, section might be yeah. good? Yeah, on our COVID resource page, we have um, information like volunteer drivers um, operating during COVID. So I would go to our resource page. Um, we have a lot of information there um, about operating and the hands-on assistance um, with uh, transportation during COVID. And I can provide um, the website and the link with that too. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we've got the Centers for Independent Living. Boy, yay, I, I love all the uh, interaction here. Mm -hmm. let's see. Um, this person, just to comment, the complexity of roads and bike lanes and floating facilities can make it more challenging for older drivers and for pedestrians with disabilities. So, um, let me see. Let me scroll down here. It's a trying to pull it from the chat here. Um, oh, we have serv. Oh darn. Okay. When question comes in, it moves it down. We have service area issues in our area with paratransit where transfers are required, and this can make trip times unrealistic. Can you speak to this? Hmm. So that's interesting. So with paratransit, there's actually transfers, I guess, between providers. Um, I, I just can't see, it, you know, doing paratransit and not and having a transfer within the system, but it could right. happen in some areas. Right. But it could probably be between providers. So you maybe it's cross-jurisdictional um, where you're doing a paratransit trip, you're getting up to another jurisdiction then you're going to do a transfer. And that's been problematic in a lot of areas to make sure that's kind of a seamless, what we call a seamless handoff with that individual. Um, and, and you know, a lot of people say, you know, I, I, we met at that location. The van came to the location, supposed to do the handoff. The other van's supposed to be there, but we sat there for 30 minutes, you know, waiting for the, for the other van and you know in some cases then the person says but then I'll, i was late for my appointment you know because of the handoff um and that is problematic and that's an issue of, of communication uh between providers um you know it could be electronic communication 
It could be you know, just a kind of a logistical issue of, of getting a vehicle to arrive at a certain time uh, so the connection uh, can happen. It's reasonable. But, um, uh, you know, I know in some areas of the country where this situation occurs, um, uh, you know, there's trying to figure out ways that um, you can ensure that the handoff and the timing um, works out. Uh, um, better, you know. So one thing they do a lot of times is they try to build a little padding in the time. So when you're going to do a handoff, it's kind of scheduled a little bit earlier than what might seem reasonable. But on the other hand, that would ensure uh, that uh, if someone's running a little bit late, the other provider or the other one, either one, the uh, connection at least will still uh, protect uh, that need for that rider to get to an appointment or just some other um, uh, destination um, on time. So, uh, Let's see, we've got, you know, about five minutes left here. So a couple final questions. This one says, are there resources that anticipate future issues in transportation uh, for purposes of trying to ease the technological challenges that are yet to come, but likely we will be facing. Hmm. So, and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think what are the technological challenges? Is it, hmm, you know, is it with riders you know, or in transit or is it, you know, with people in personal vehicles, you know, there's like, Two different issues here, right? So, um, hmm. let's see. I don't if, know. Oh, hold on. They say uh, such as dashboard touch screens as well uh -huh. as topological. So, okay. Gotcha. Well, that same same kind of issue, like when you're in the car, and. Yeah, you got all those touch screens controlling, and that's where cars are going now. There's um, touch screens um, for controlling everything within the car, and that's just, they're hard to use, you know. And, and if you don't have even, you can drive a car, but you may not have good uh, hand eye dexterity or even vision, because some touch screens are just hard to see. Um, and then, you know, you've been in cars where when you have glare on your touch screen, it's, Totally um, not working at all, but but the point would be, I mean, yeah, I think I think somewhere along the lines, you know, there's got to be some kind of discussion around, you know, workarounds, you know, um, you know beyond the touch screen. Um, so, yeah, you know, that probably is maybe that's transportation research board TRB or somebody else, but you know, there's there's um, Probably somebody needs to do some studies uh, between, um, you know, advanced electronics, advanced, uh, um, what's the word I was using, <laughs> looking for um, um, amenities, I guess, within a car or whatever, um, um, and older adults. You know, somebody, I think, could, could study it from that, that angle. Yeah. You know? Even I think for some people, you know, adjusting the seat. <laughs> yeah. Somebody says, "Hey, you're got to say, oh yeah, this uh, seat adjusts in 16 different ways." <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> some people go, "Well, I can't get my seat adjusted right. You know, it's just too complicated." <laughs> so. And I want to thank you again for joining us today um, at the uh, Mid Atlantic ADA Center. And you can reach us at any time if you have any additional questions at 1-800-949-4232. You can call us local at 301-217-0124. Or you can shoot us an email at adainfo at transcend.org. So again, I want to thank our presenters for joining us today. And um, please join us on February 10th for um, our next webinar, which will be um, Lessons Learned. Um, from COVID uh, by ADA coordinators. So we're going to have a panel of ADA coordinators who are going to speak to some of what they have um, managed during the pandemic. So again, thank you all for joining us and hope you'll join us next time. Bye-bye.